God. This is a nugget for somebody. And if you haven't thought about it this way, I want you to listen to this perspective and consider it. Because it is what we have seen of the almighty creator himself, of the God of all flesh and the father of all spirits. When you observe a situation in your life that is without form and void, when darkness is upon the face of situations, of hearts, of visions, of dreams, of destinies, of generational blessings, when darkness seems to be covering the light, when darkness seems to, have, to be on all of what you have put before the Lord, I want to encourage you, seek the presence of God. Because once the presence of God is sought, once the Spirit of the Lord is hovering over the face of the deep, you will hear the voice of God. And the Bible says, and God said, let there be, and there was. Whatever God has said materializes once his presence comes. Father, we thank you for the joy of your presence. And Lord, as we come into your presence, bringing our sacrifices of praise, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. And there is nothing else that we can say that is sweeter than saying, Lord, we love you. Father, we love you, not just in here. We love you at home. We love you in our cars. We love you at work. We love you when dealing with clients. We love you when dealing with neighbors. We love you when dealing with spouses. We love you when dealing with children. Because we aren't supposed to just love you in words, but we are to love you indeed. So let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. In your ears, Father, let it be a sweet sound, this sacrifice of praise that we bring. And may we never tire of saying that we love you, O oh God. Because you first loved us. And you have loved us with an everlasting love. So for us to love you is only a response to the call that you made. It never gets easier than that. In your Let's just take that part of the song again. I love you, Lord. I love you, O oh Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear, O oh God, in what you hear, Lord, let it be, may it be a sweet, sweet, sweet sound, may it be a sweet, sweet sound Father we worship your holy name we thank you because your presence is here you are here and we are here and that is the sweetness of fellowship when we are not keeping you waiting and when we are not running without you in the mighty name of Jesus praise the Lord Let's just give God praise. Let's just celebrate the presence of God that is in here tonight. Praise the Lord. Oh, say the man he can and don't see the little yellow baba. Oh, Lord, we give you all the praise. Hallelujah. God is good. All righty, let's be seated real quick. God bless you. Thank you so very much. We appreciate you guys a great deal. I mean, I just, I don't know about you, but I was able to tap in 
into the melody of God's presence right from the time that we were having that pre-service prayer or that opening prayer. And thank God for the ministry of this intercessor here. I mean, I just, I love it when the person leading worship is not doing it so that they can take a clip of it and use it to promote their YouTube channel. When they're doing it, when genuinely they just love the presence of their Heavenly Father. You know, you all have been in places where you can tell. You don't even have to be too much in the spirit or be overly discerning to know that this is all acting, you know? Uh, and, and, and so, all the theatrics aside, it's always great when you have such a strong devotion to the presence of God. And it shows. It shows when, you know, the Bible says Jesus himself speaking. He says, many will come in my name. He says, but by their fruits, you shall know them. You can go watch a magic show, but you never get to take the dove home. You know, they can bring, you know, cats and all kinds of things out of the hat. But you never get to take any one of those things home because they're nothing but illusions. But when you come to a place where the presence of God is genuine and tangible, guess what? You have something that you can take home with you. A piece of that passion can go home with you. You can go home and begin to replicate what you experience here at home. It's amazing and I'm just so thankful to God for what we have in here and it's good to have you guys here. Some people are still celebrating Christmas, obviously, because they're not here. Yeah, but um, we thank God that we, we're here. Um, even though, you know, what we typically or used to do was kind of like take a break from the time we have our Christmas party until we'll come back for the watch night service. Uh, but this particular year, I just felt like I mean, it'd be nice to have a service before the watch night service. You know, something that is kind of like a ramp. Let's build some expectation. Let's have some, um, some reorientation, if you would. And I'm glad because one of the things that the Holy Spirit put in my heart today is, I mean, it'd be great for a watch night service, but I think it's actually better for a pre-watch night service. Because the Holy Spirit said to me, he said the focus of many people at this time is on their, actually before we get into that, Matthew chapter 7 verse 13. I want us to read this verse of scripture just to give us some, you know, some footing and some substance. <laughs> You know what Jesus said? Jesus said something phenomenal. I mean, he's, everything he says is phenomenal. But this one thing, I find, I find it especially profound. He said, as I am, so are you. And one of the things that Jesus was very careful to demonstrate or intentional at demonstrating to us was that he had the power to forgive sins. Right? So there was a man that was brought to him whose hands had withered away. And Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven. And all the religious people were sitting there and they're like, How dare you say that you can forgive anybody's sins? <laughs> I'm, about, but I'm about to make a statement here, which is something that I heard of the Holy Spirit. I'm just here to echo that and, and to be a witness of that to y'all. And this is what the Lord said to me. He said, your sins are forgiven. And what sin is he talking about in particular? He's talking about the sin of disobedience. Some of us here, the reason why we don't hear God as clearly is because in the past, the Holy Spirit spoke to us, but we didn't do what he said. You know, and the Bible says that there is no blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that gets forgiven. And I've explained that. It's not like the Holy Spirit is waiting at the gates of heaven to make sure that he doesn't let you in because you blasphemed. What is the meaning of blasphemy? Blasphemy simply means to degrade or to disregard a person's name that describes their worth. So a person's name that describes their worth, if you degrade or deny or defame that name, that is blasphemy. So God is good, right? We call him a good God. 
But if you look at what things are happening in the world and you say, oh, if God is a good God, then why do we have earthquakes and why do we have people live, living on the streets and all that stuff? That is blasphemy because essentially you are defaming a name of God that is an attribute of who he, of who he is and the worth that he brings to your life. Right? And Jesus says, y'all can do that all day and still be forgiven. Why? Because even though you deny God his goodness by saying that he is not a good God, by blasphemy, by blaspheming, guess what? He still doesn't strike you down dead at that time. In fact, he still allows it to rain upon you because the Bible says God allows it to rain upon the good and the wicked. Right? Now, Jesus, the son, you can blaspheme the son and sort of get away with it. Because when Jesus says no sin or no blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is forgiven, he says that against the father will be forgiven, against the son will be forgiven. He, he was saying to be forgiven means for you to not receive the full consequence of what you have done. But with the Holy Spirit, he is the teacher so if you deny his worth in your life as the teacher, you do not learn anything from him. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. But if you do not recognize his office, and if you do not magnify his name as the comforter, the Holy Spirit will not force you to be comforted. Your heavenly father can still insist on doing certain things for you, even though you do not acknowledge that he is able. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How many of us here asked for Jesus to come? We didn't, but he came anyway. You understand what I mean? Romans chapter 3 says why we were, Romans chapter 3 verse 5. Whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But concerning the Holy Spirit, Jesus says the Holy Spirit is not just going to come accidentally. You have to ask for him. He says, ask for the spirit of truth. Ask for him, the spirit of truth, and also ask in truth that he may come. And so when it comes to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, when he speaks to you and you aren't obeying what he says, that is considered a grievance. And that's why the Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Remember in Exodus, the very first time that God introduced the concept of the Holy Spirit, to Moses, he said to Moses, he says, I am going to send my angel, capital A, to go before you. And when Moses was excited, he says, no, come back before you run off. He said, tell your brothers and sisters that they cannot grieve my angel because he doesn't forgive. It was an exodus. Jesus was quoting from that instance. When he says, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you, you don't get away with it. You do not blaspheme his worth as the teacher and still get taught. You don't blaspheme his worth as the comforter and still get what? Comforted. Until you allow yourself to magnify the office of the Holy Spirit in sweet surrender, you do not enjoy his fellowship. We've seen the Heavenly Father come grab people by the hand and drag them out of the fire. You say, you're not dying today. I know you've been heady, you've been strong-headed, but I'm still going to make sure that I save you. You've seen Jesus, the good shepherd, even though you chose to get lost because he was leading you and you refused. Guess what? He will still leave the 99. I remember there was a time that I left my place by my wife, which is supposed to walk hand in hand with her, and I was just running with my own ideas. The Lord Jesus found me. I was that lost sheep. And he told me, he says, look, I already gave you help that is meat. Don't try to think you know it all. You see what I mean? I didn't ask him to come and save me because I thought I was doing the right thing. But Jesus will come as the good shepherd. But guess what? The Holy Spirit is a gentle spirit in that regard. He is not going to wrestle with you. And so the Lord said to me today, I heard it while Bennett was there. He said to me, tell him that his sins are forgiven. And I know that that is a word for all of us in here today. That as we're going into 2023, the Lord is saying that our sins are forgiven. 
the sin of disobedience so that we can start afresh being able to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. Praise the Lord. Let me just give you a bit more confidence boost. Jesus, when he saw the man with the withered hand, he said to him, you see, because quite often we are too focused on the material. We think the material is our problem. You know, many of us are too worried about the money that we don't have. And God is concerned about the knowledge that you lack. You see, many of us are too concerned about the pain and the infirmity in our bodies. And God is concerned about the cripple of your soul. You know, a lot of the miracles that Jesus did, healing people's bodies, he did it because he wanted to fix people's minds. Let me say that again. God is more concerned about your soul than he is about your body. The moment Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, that moment that they lost the glory of, that they lost the glory of God that was their covering. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, "For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God." From that moment this body did not mean anything anymore to heaven. <coughs> Let me say that again. You see, God is not a reckless God, neither is he an irresponsible father. The reason why the outward man perishes is because to a very great extent, heaven resigned from the natural man because it has already fallen. But many of us, we focus too much on this outer body. The Bible says the outward man perishes every day. Something that has the attention of God does not perish because if God focuses on a thing, it receives life. And because God is life. The Bible says of the Lord Jesus that in him was life and that life was the light of man that shines forth in darkness that darkness cannot comprehend. You can't have God's attention and still be depleted. It's not possible. That was why everybody that Jesus called who went the other way, they remained dead. Jesus found a man and he saw ministry material in him. You know, he's the creator. The Bible says all things were made by the word and there was nothing made that was made without the word. He saw the man and he says, you, follow me. And the man says, well, my father just died. I need to bury him. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. But you, follow me. Because anyone that is not in alignment with life is dead. Because the meaning of death is what? The absence of life. If you read through the scriptures, whenever people have been raised back to life, what he said concerning them, that life came into them. Even man, when he was made initially from the dust of the earth, he was lifeless until life came into him. So if you are not in life and life is not in you, you are dead. And so Jesus was calling a man who was dead to come to life. And he said he wanted to go and bury another dead man. And that was why Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. But you follow me. What did he do? He did the other. He remained dead and he went to bury the dead. So the reality of our existence is such that this body is not as in alignment with heaven as it needs to be. And that is the reason why it's perishing. And God is like, yes, I don't want you to focus on the things that are temporal, but focus on the things that are eternal. Jesus says, don't care too much about this body because even this body and all the functions thereof are going to be done away with. He says, but be more concerned with the soul. And so I want to encourage you that in these times that we're going into, don't concern yourself too much about the material things that you do not have as much as the things of your soul. Look at Jesus' miracles and then you get a full understanding. You see, when Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, your sins are forgiven. It was not because Jesus could not see that he had no hands. So the man, his hands had withered away from leprosy, perhaps. Right? And so he was standing there with no hands. If it was you and I, what do we do? These days when people come up for, for altar calls, what do we do? We want to address the most obvious problem with them. We have become Captain Obviouses or Captain Obvious, whichever one is correct. 
But Jesus was not addressing the obvious in the natural. He was addressing the cogent in the spirit. So he said to him, your sins are forgiven. He said, however, for the sake of these religious people who are misjudging my priorities. Because they thought Jesus had his priorities upside down. What has forgiveness got to do with this? This man, this man needs hands. What did Jesus say? Jesus says, but for your sake, stretch forth your hand. And he stretched forth his hand. And he says, which is easier? To say that your sins are forgiven or to make new hands out of no hands. You see what Jesus is driving at? Jesus is saying that forgiveness is a bigger miracle than having hands grow where there were no hands. Many of us would think that praying for somebody that is crippled to get out of their seat is the biggest miracle. Because, let me tell you something, Manuel Leader, if I pray for you to be four inches taller and for your hair to start to grow to your ankle, you understand what I mean? Bro <laughs> you see? The reality of it is that many of us, we want such miracles. But even if this body was made perfect in the state that it's in, it is not useful to God. What God wants you and him to partner on is a 1,000 year assignment and this body cannot make it. And so God has already done away with this body. And he already has new bodies for you. Jesus says, I go to prepare mansions for you. New temples with which you will be able to last the duration of your divine millennial assignment. And so why do I need all that miracle here when this is only temporal? But Jesus says, well, so that they might believe. He was trying to help their destiny. But there is a blessing that is more. You see, the, the real blessing of following God lies in believing when you haven't seen such things. Jesus says, blessed are those who whilst haven't seen, haven't seen, they believe. The Pharisees did not believe until they saw. And what did they do? Even after they saw, they remained in their unbelief. Jesus says your sins are forgiven. Forgiveness of sins, restoration of the soul, equipping the inner man should be our focus at all times. Jesus says stretch forth your hand and the hand grew so that people may know that sins have to be forgiven. I say all of that to say that rather than begging God for a bigger house, for a new car, for more money in the bank, beg God for his voice. Ask him to forgive your unbelief, to forgive your disobedience. And the opportunity that we have here today is the word of God has come forth. I heard it. The Lord said to me, your sins are forgiven. And he says, as I am in this world, so are you. So he turned to his disciples and what did he tell them? Victoria, he said to them, whoever you forgive is forgiven. So do you now see the reason why the devil promotes unforgiveness in our lives today? Because Satan knows that we have the power to forgive people and to set them free. And that is the reason why he keeps telling us that they are not worthy of our forgiveness. Because every time you think about the people that have hurt you, you remember all of what they have done to you. And God is saying, no, can you just remember one thing that I did for them and for you so that you can forgive them and let them go? Because if you don't forgive them, how will they forgive? Jesus says, whoever you forgive is forgiven. He came to model to us an example. There is this question that is floating online. People are asking this question that if Jesus was truly God, then why did he pray? And who did he pray to? But why is that a question? Jesus already told us the reason why he prayed. Why did Jesus pray? He said, Father, I thank you because you hear me always. 
I don't have to pray. You hear me always while I am here thinking. Do you know that Jesus is the thought of God because your thoughts become your word? And so whatever Jesus is planning to do is exactly what God is thinking of doing. So he says, Father, I thank you because you hear me always. He said, but that for these ones, for their sakes, so that they may believe. He now spoke out loud. The reason why Jesus prayed as much as he did was to model to us an example. Everything Jesus did, he did as an example to us. Even coming to die for us. Jesus did not have to come and die at Calvary. The Bible says he was already slain from the foundations of the earth for the remission of sins. But he came so that we can see vividly an example of the love of God. When he said, greater love has no man than this, than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. In this coming year, I want to encourage you, let your focus be on intentionally equipping your soul. You see, every other thing outside of your soul is dependent on your soul. The Bible says in the third epistle of John, third John verse two, that brethren, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. A lot of people who have cancer in their body, we know that when you, when they have been interviewed, several people who have been seriously cancerous in their bodies, it's not because they were eating canned food. Look at all of us, we eat stuff from the can. That's not what's killing us. Unforgiveness. Let me tell you something. A lot of the people who have diseases and infirmities in their bodies, they, they hold a grudge that they may have even forgotten about. And that is the reason why it manifests in the body as cancer. Because when unforgiveness takes root in your subconscious, you are no longer conscious of it. You don't see it. You can't put your finger on it, but it's eating you up from the inside, just like cancer does. And that is the reason why we need to fix the gentleman of the heart. Let me read this scripture and then I'm going to go back to what I was telling you about 2023. Matthew chapter 7. If I let's read from verse 12 very briefly. The Bible says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. This is the law and the prophets. Verse 13. And I believe that I've taught on that subject enough. You know what that means. You know how to apply that in your daily lives. It sounds very simple. Like, okay, I'm going to treat people the way that I want to be treated. Right? We say that all the time. Be, be, be kind to people and people will be kind to you and all that good stuff. But I tell you this, as simple as it sounds, it goes deeper than that. And I'm not going to dwell on that subject, but I want to give you another perspective real quick about that verse of scripture because it's foundational to what I'm about to read. If I, let's read verse 18 and then you'll understand where I'm coming from. It says a good tree cannot, verse 18 of Matthew 7, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad fruit bear, uh, what am I reading? Nor can a bad tree, rather, bear good fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruits by God's divine order. In the same way, a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Now, when Jesus says, whatsoever you want people to do to you, do unto them. Jesus says the fruit that you want to bear in the lives of people is the tree that you need to be. So it goes beyond just actions. It is actually talking about your nature. You need to relate with people based on your divine nature. Can I explain that a little further? You see, your divine nature is the only good part of you. The Bible says that whosoever or whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, right? And what is born of God? Your spirit. The Bible says your spirit is born of God. And that is the reason why your spirit cannot sin because God cannot sin. Your born again spirit is essentially an extension of the heavenly father in the similitude of Christ. Do you understand that? So your born again spirit cannot sin. 
That is the scripture that many people have misinterpreted by saying, wow, whatsoever is born of God cannot sin. So no matter what I do, it cannot be regarded as sin. No. The things that you do in your flesh is still sin. So if the reason why, if I get up now and the Spirit is leading me to slap Anita, if I'm doing it because I'm being led by the Spirit, it is not sin because you will see a miraculous outcome that will glorify God. Remember the gentleman by the name of Smith Wigglesworth. A lady was brought to him who had a tumor and the tumor was so big, it was visible from the outside. What we would have done today is we would be pouring anointing oil on it and be massaging it. But he came and he gave her a deadly blow to the tumor. And people were like, yeah, that's it. Lawsuit written in capital letters. Oh, he's going to jail. They were already planning how to visit him in jail. I'll take him a sandwich on Monday. What are you going to do on Wednesday? It's over for this man because the tumor did not immediately go down. If anything at all, it, be it became even more swollen. But guess what? Shortly afterwards, it all disappeared because he did it being led by the Spirit. But then if I, if I do that by the Spirit, you will see a fruit, a good fruit will come out of it. But if I go to her and I start, you know, patting her on the back and say, oh, you're doing well. And I'm doing that out of the flesh. Even though I'm giving her a friendly commendation before God, it is a sin what I am doing. Because there are people that God send us, sends us to to rebuke that we have encouraged. The Bible says that open rebuke is better than love that is carefully concealed. So some people that you're supposed to rebuke, no, it's okay. Because let me tell you something, I've done a lot of that myself particularly in ministry because there are people in ministry that have had an opportunity to disciple and I didn't want to hurt their feelings so I commended them when I was supposed to rebuke them and eventually guess what <laughs> whatever it was that I was trying to avoid their feelings were still hurt anyway Simply because the Lord was asking me to be in the spirit and deliver a blow of correction. The Bible says, as a crown is fitting for the head of a king, so are mighty blows fitting for the mouth of a fool. For the mouth of a fool. So when someone is mouthing foolish things, I'm not supposed to commend them simply because I want to be politically correct and I want to be a gentle man. God did not call me to be a gentleman. Niceness is not the fruit of the spirit. I remember my pastor growing up, he used to say something that was not totally English, even though he was using English words. He used to say, whatsoever you compromise to keep, you will lose uncompromisingly. The English is not correct, totally, but it sounds like you know what I mean. Whatever you compromise to keep, you will lose uncompromisingly which means one way or the other you will still lose it because the bible says that the unrighteousness of man cannot produce the divine will of god so i can't continue to do things in the flesh to people and expect to reap a spiritual outcome because the only way anybody can do you good man or leader is if they are also in the spirit because the bible says none is good not even one but the father and the only way you can manifest the attributes of the father is to be in the spirit because god is not the father of your flesh the bible says he is the god of all spirits I mean, he's the father of all spirits, the God of all flesh. He's the creator of your flesh, but he's not the father of your flesh. And that is the reason why your flesh does not manifest the attributes of God, because it is not born of God. It is your spirit that is born of God. And so if you want to enjoy heaven on earth, wherein everybody that you're relating with is bringing out the God attribute, then you must always bring your God attribute. And that is the reason why Jesus said, if someone slaps you on one side, turn to the other side. What is the other side? The spirit. There are two sides, the flesh, the spirit, and there is the fulcrum in the middle, which is the pivot that chooses, and that is the soul. That's what that scripture means. We used to think it meant that if someone slapped you on the physical cheek, you turn the other one. In today's world, people are so hungry for slaps that they will slap the other one too. Have you tried that before? You make a comment on Facebook, they insult you, you go to Instagram, and they even insult you before you make the comment because they know you're coming. 
So if you turn the other natural side, they will still slap it. What Jesus was saying is, if someone comes at you in the natural, you turn the other side of you, which is the spirit, and allow your mind to understand the difference. Because your mind is the pivot that chooses which side you get. So Jesus is saying, if you want people to be godly with you, be godly with them. They can come and tell you bad things about somebody. What do you do? You do not encourage that. What do you do? You come at them from the spirit angle. What is the spirit of the Lord saying about the same person? When the disciples of John the Baptist, when they came to Jesus, we knew that they had talked about Jesus behind Jesus' back. With John the Baptist, John the Baptist had gone out of his ministry assignment. He went back to his previous life in Elijah by trying to finish the score that he didn't settle with Jezebel. You know the story. And when he was sent to the world again, you know Micah, in Micah chapter 4 verse 6, I believe he said that before the Messiah comes, Elijah will come again as the forerunner of the Messiah, turning the hearts of the fathers back to the sons and the sons back to the father. Right? When angel Gabriel appeared to Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, what did he say? He says, your wife Elizabeth, even though she's past the age of childbearing, will be found with a child and this child will be the one that turns the heart of the children back to the father, father back to the son. So we knew that Gabriel was saying, Elijah is coming through you. But because he was speaking to a Bible scholar, Zachariah lived in the temple. He had no job all day than to study scriptures. So when Gabriel said, you will call the boy's name John, Zachariah was like, what kind of name is that? That doesn't fit what you just said. We should just call him Elijah. But John, what's his name? Gabriel did not allow him to finish what he was saying. He zipped his mouth. I always tell people, if you don't know what to say, say nothing. It is better for you to be dumb and be at peace with God than to open your mouth and then open the gates of hell. So here is the dealio. John the Baptist, when he came, he came as Elijah. When Jesus asked him, I mean, when, when, when the disciples asked Jesus, Jesus said, if you have the heart to receive it, this John is Elijah that was promised to come. And when he came, he came as the forerunner of Jesus. He was the voice of him crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He did all of what he was supposed to do. That was his only assignment. But after a while, he just realized Wait a minute, that must be Jezebel and Ahab. Because at the same time, what the devil's been doing from the beginning was whenever God raises a person, Satan raises his own people too. That has been the battle from the beginning. Right? When God raised people like Methuselah, when he raised people like Enoch, people like Lamech, people like Noah, Satan was also raising giants on the earth. Because he wanted to fight the seed of the woman to the ground. You understand what I'm saying? And so when John the Baptist was done introducing Jesus, he was supposed to just retire and wait for the chariot of fire. But he decided to go after Jezebel and Ahab. And what did he get for it? You know, Jezebel said, I will cut off the head of Elijah. But she didn't get to do it because God preserved Elijah. But what happened eventually was Jezebel got the head of John the Baptist. I'm only summarizing it because I've, I've taught a full message on the subject. And the reason why that is important is this. God allowed for us to see that example because God does not want you to go back to who you were. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are a new creation. John the Baptist should have stayed in Christ Jesus after having seen the Holy Spirit alight upon Jesus and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. But he was listening to the old self. And he perished. The Bible says to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. What I'm telling you folks is that we need to learn how not to be in the flesh but to be in the spirit because it doesn't end well. John the Baptist who spoke so gracefully concerning Jesus. He says, the one that comes after me, what am I doing? I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm only playing here. I'm baptizing you with water. He said, but the one that comes after me will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. He is so mighty that I cannot undo his sandals. But then the moment he stepped back into his previous life and became political and became vengeful, 
You know the reason why they put him in prison was because he went after Jezebel and Ahab. He went after Herod for taking his brother's wife, who turns out to be the Jezebel, who asked for his head on the platter. I mean, this thing is, is like a soap opera. You understand what I mean? But guess what happens? The moment he started walking in that order, he stopped magnifying Jesus. He started questioning the authority of Jesus. He gathered his disciples together and poisoned them against Jesus. He said, go and ask that dude, is he really the one or should we expect? How can you? <sighs> Let me tell you something. John the Baptist promoted Jesus to the point wherein some of his disciples left him and followed Jesus. Remember that Andrew was, was John the Baptist's disciple. Peter was not yet sure if he wanted to be in the ministry when John the Baptist was baptizing at the Jordan. But the moment they saw Jesus, Peter was like, uh, okay, I'm in. But Andrew was the real dude. That was what happened when Andrew heard John the Baptist say, behold the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. He said to John the Baptist, your assignment is done. We were following you as the forerunner, but this is the one you're forerunning for. We will follow him. Peter, Peter was like, I'm in too. That was, look at many of us. Isn't that how we started our walk with Jesus? That by the testimony of him that we give, others come to know the Lord. And then after a while, the same you who have led people to the Lord begin to question his grace. So what did John the Baptist do? He started, I tell people, one way by which you know, if you, many people get text messages from me regularly here, I dislike using the question mark. Because that question mark is a very terrible thing. The Bible says, well not the Bible, Josh Ruskin. He said if you put a question mark where God has put a period, it's over. You can't question what God has said, who God is. I'm saying that as an indicator. Um, Bennett, can we have that music continue to play? Can you see to it, please? So when you see John the Baptist questioning Jesus, then you know that something's gone horribly wrong. Take a cue from John. The moment you see yourself questioning who God is, questioning the grace of God, questioning the call of God upon your life, questioning what God has told you. Let me tell you something. God says, love your neighbor as yourself. The moment you begin to question if somebody is worthy of your sacrifice, worthy of your forgiveness, you are already in the flesh. Wake up quickly and be in the spirit. That is one easy way by which you just know that you are stepping out of line. The moment you begin, when God says, give to bless somebody, and you're like, hmm, that person, I don't even think they're good with money. It's not your business. You understand what I mean? It isn't. The Lord is saying, be a blessing. Right? So the moment you find yourself questioning if that person is worthy, that is your flesh. Your spirit will not question what God has said. That is how you know when you have been led by the spirit. You go to a party, they give you one glass of wine, and you know that your threshold is two. I mean, it's one. Let's just stay there. You know that once you take more than one, there's trouble. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine wherein there is dissipation. The word dissipation is also the word excess. It says, do not be drunk with wine wherein there is excess. Don't go above your threshold so that the wine does not take over. He says, do not be drunk with wine wherein there is excess, but be led by the Spirit. You can't be led by alcohol and the Spirit at the same time. And that is the reason why they call alcohol Spirit, so that you know what you're dealing with. We call those things spirits, right? Yeah, so that you don't have an excuse to say, oh, I didn't know. You know. Because you know the kind of things that you try to do when you're under the influence. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, you receive some kind of unholy boldness. You know that friend of yours that cannot speak to a woman, but then the moment he has more than his threshold, the moment he's in dissipation, wherein he has taken excess, then he receives that boldness and you see him bouncing like a Rastafari. And it's like, so baby, the same dude. The only woman he can talk to without alcohol is his mom. But now he becomes 
It becomes, suddenly becomes a chihuahua all over the place. It is the same. That is how you and I are supposed to be led by the Holy Spirit. Wherein you are involuntarily doing the things of God. You see, let me tell you something. You can be drunk with the Holy Spirit to the point wherein you find yourself doing righteous things and you're like, is that really me? Yeah. Is that really me? Look, can I give you an example? Peter was not bold enough to speak about Jesus in public. He denied Jesus three times. The only time he was confident to speak about Jesus was when the other disciples were there. And he would first of all check around to make sure that nobody hears him. But the moment he was filled with the Holy Spirit to the point where the Holy Spirit was shooting out of his head, the Bible says there appeared upon them divided tongues as of fire. Guess what happened? He spoke boldly about the Lord Jesus. And guess who he was rebuking? He was rebuking the Jews. But after a while, Peter became religious and he was no longer as full of the Holy Spirit. And P Paul had to call him out. Paul was like, Peter, brother Peter, what happened to you? Why have you suddenly become accommodating of the people dragging us back into the law? When the Jews set up a panel and they came to Peter, Peter changed his words. He told Paul and the rest of them that, oh, salvation is by grace. We don't care about circumcision. But then as soon as Paul left the room and the Jews came in, he was like, actually, you know what, gentlemen, not to sound rude or anything, I think I like what you're saying. So you can see in the life of Peter how important it was for him to be filled with the Holy Spirit on the full. Okay, once Highland grabs the offering basket, I know it's time to wrap up. So let me read to you verse 13. Actually, I'll save verse 13 for another day. But here is the deal. This is what the Holy Spirit said to me, and I'm gonna just kind of land this plane the way Joshua lands planes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I see, I knew, you knew I was gonna call you out. He said to me earlier, he was like, oh, you need to come and see my new landing routine because he flies planes on the computer. And I was like, is this what you called me to come and see? You literally just gave like 14 people a heart attack the way you landed the plane, suddenly. But sometimes you have to land suddenly because it's an emergency. Alan is on the move. So here is the deal. The Holy Spirit said this to me. He said, tell your brothers and sisters that at this time, it is not as important to make resolutions about your habits as it is to make about your heartbeat. Let me say that again. When you come to the end of one year and the beginning of another, many people's focus is on their habits. Oh, this year, I'm gonna to go to the gym eight days a week. I'm gonna consume minus 400 calories every day. You know, you have all these habits. In fact, let me even bring it home to the things of God. You say to yourself, this new year, I will study my Bible every day. I want to make it a habit. And that looks like a good thing, right? But let me tell you something. If it looks like a good thing, but it's not coming from a good tree, it could easily be a bad thing. So don't focus on the habit. You could make all the... We've done it. Do you know how many times you have said, this new year, I will start the Bible and finish it. This new year, I will witness to at least one person every week. You make all those resolutions and then you try to make it based on a change of habit and there's no power in it. The Holy Spirit is saying, shift your focus because everybody is trying to do it by their habits. That was why we were going to read Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 that says broad is the way that leads to destruction but narrow is the way that leads to life. Don't do what everybody else is doing. Every motivational speaker, every personal pastor and coach online is telling you, right? That this is how you need to do it, by habits. But I have come with the voice of him crying in the wilderness, saying, forget about the habit. If you can get your heart beat right, your heart beat, if you can get that right, the habit will only be a fruit. Do you know that the fruit of the Spirit, having the right habit is the fruit of the Spirit. It is not a work. 
It is something that happens when you are walking in the Spirit. When you read all the fruits of the Spirit, you know, and here are the fruits of the Spirit. Love, patience, kindness, long-suffering, this and that. What was the last thing there? Self-control. What is self-control? Self-control is when you have a habit of doing that which is right. You understand what I mean? If you can keep yourself from sleeping when you should be working out, if you should keep your, if you can keep yourself from slumbering when you should be praying, if you can keep yourself from watching Netflix when you should be studying the Bible, you will say that you have cultivated a good habit because you have self-control. But self-control is not meant to be your goal, it's not the means, it is the end. The means of getting to self-control is by being in the Spirit. So don't focus on habits so that you don't end up as disappointed as you have always been. Focus on your heartbeat. What is your heart beating for? Why do you want to study the Bible? Is it so that you can win debates over Tyler? If that is the reason why, then you may end up with a good habit, but it will lack the power. But if truly you want to study your Bible because you know that you lack the vocabulary for expressing the glory of God, you lack the vocabulary for encouraging yourself in times of trouble, because you recognize that the Bible says for a man of God to be perfect and be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. The Bible says he has to have the scriptures. If that is what is in your heart, let me tell you something, the habit will form by itself. If you want to make it a habit to come to church and come regularly, don't just put it on your calendar because there are things that will override your calendar. Set your heart on understanding the reason why you have to make it to fellowship. What does the word of God say? Do not forsake the gathering together. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 of yourselves as what? As the habits of some will become. Some people have made it a habit of not coming, which is a negative habit. So for you to make it a positive habit, you need to find a heart for fellowship. You need to recondition your heart to long for fellowship. Like I was saying earlier, we were going to take this Tuesday off as well, but I just was uncomfortable. I was unsettled within me. I told my wife, I said, I don't think I want to go for like 10 days without seeing people. Oh yeah. Because of the fact that God does not want to go for as long without seeing your face. He wants to see you all the time. Of all the things that God has made, the galaxies, the stars, the, the, the firmament, everything. It is you that he is more interested in seeing. The Bible says that of all the things that God has made, there is nothing that gets his attention like you. The eye of the Lord runs to and fro upon the earth, seeking for people whose hearts are stayed on him. And so when you find the heart, of God concerning a thing and you allow your heartbeat to be in sync with that of God, your flesh will have no choice but to bow. Simply because when your spirit is resolute and your spirit receives alignment with God, your soul comes into alignment as well. And once your soul comes into alignment, your body has lost the battle because without your soul, your spirit cannot challenge. I mean, your flesh cannot challenge your spirit. So I want to encourage you. And I'm going to give you a verse of scripture very quickly. Psalms 107. Just to help you to go to begin to practice on your own what it means to have a heart that is in alignment with God. And I believe by now we all have the communion. Even I do as well. So maybe we'll make this Psalm 107. Okay, we'll make Psalm 106 our communion scripture. 106 verse 7. But we're going to read first uh, Psalms 107 verse 11. And we're going to see something there about the heart. How do we recondition our hearts to beat for God? Look at the Psalms 107 verse 11. It says, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was no one to help. The Bible says because of the fact that they rebelled against what? The word of God. And they did not regard his counsel. What happened? He brought down their heart to labor. What is labor? Labor represent, represents works. Many of us are trying to fix the problems of our lives by laboring with our hearts. 
you want your heart to be committed so that you can have the right habit. Oh, I'm going to do this by habit. I'm going to be regimented. No, the Bible says that that is actually a consequence of having forgotten the word of God. So how do you get your heart to beat instead of your habit doing the work for you? Go back to the word. Repent from having despised the word of God. Those times that he spoke to you that you did not obey. Go back and say, Lord, I'm sorry. You once told me that I need to call my father and tell him that for this particular incident that I've been judging him for, I am sorry. I forgive you, Father. You did the best that you could. And I even celebrate you for it. But you're like, yeah, that is kind of like water under the bridge. It's been swept, out, swept under the carpet. Let sleeping dogs lie. No, sleeping dogs cannot lie in the presence of God. You need to send them out. You understand what I mean? You need to deal with those things because that's what the word of God says. The Bible says that if anybody has an ought against you and you know it, seek peace. But you haven't sought peace with people. You despise the word of God and you did not regard his counsel. That is the reason why you're now struggling to do things by your works and by your habits. And the Bible says they will be brought low and they will have no results. Let's read it again. Verse 12. He says they fell down and there was no one to help. And you're like, why is God not helping me with this? Why am I struggling to kick this habit? Why am I struggling to kick this addiction? And God is saying, the reason why you are struggling with the labor is because you did not regard my word. You blasphemed by not regarding the authority of my word. And the Lord is saying to you today, you are receiving a second chance because your sins are forgiven. How does the Lord send his word? He sends his words through the mouth of his angels, through the mouth of his prophets. And he has sent me to you today to say to you that your sins are forgiven. Not so that you can start parading your new shining cloak, but so that you can receive a fresh start to begin to allow the word of God to take its place and then your heart will beat in accordance with the heart of God so that you do not labor. Let me tell you something. Go and study this thing. Write it down, take a note, or watch the video when we upload it on Thursday. Psalms 107. The Lord is telling you the reason why your, your heart favors habit over heartbeat. Oh, thank you. In fact, there's no better way to say wrap up than that. Let us rise up. Actually, let's still sit down and break bread. And then we'll stand up to pray afterwards. Sorry, and then we'll stand up to pray afterwards. So let's sit down. So... I said that is our breaking bread scripture. No, did I say, is this our breaking bread scripture? Or oh, there's another one. Yeah, since I already said it, we might as well just read it, right? 106 verse what? Were you paying attention? What verse? Yeah, you were not paying attention. 7, verse 7. This is Psalms, so Psalms 107 that we just read 11, 12, and maybe a little bit of 13 if you have the interest, is your, is your assignment, okay? I have given you an introduction because I've been told I preached for too long, so I've decided now what I'm, I will do mostly is give you an introduction and let you go and finish it off on your own. Go and study that and understand what it means to develop a heartbeat for God by submitting to his word so that you don't have to struggle with habits. Okay? Go and finish that off on your, on your own. But this one is going to be a quick walk of righteousness just to break bread. Now, the Lord says we should rise. Let us stand up and read this together. I'll wait for y'all to get there. I'm going to be reading from the New Kingdom's Bible, so if you want to just switch your phone translation to that, uh, do that. If you want to read along, but just um, say amen. The Bible says in Psalms 106 verse 7, our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. I, I say this very carefully. Whenever you see the word red in the Bible, pay very close attention. Red in the Bible typically talks about you. When God made man, what did he call man? He called man red. Adam means red. Right? Adam means red. 
And so when you see the word red, particularly the Red Sea, the Red Sea typically represents the people of the world. Because sea represents a multitude of people. So where did they rebel? They rebelled at the Red Sea. Does that sound familiar today? A lot of the reasons why you don't do what God's word says is because it's not popular. That's not what everybody is doing. The word of God says no sex before marriage. But everyone's doing it. FOMO is a real thing. If you let it, the fear of missing out. And there is no shortage of people to tell you to disobey God. They will start appearing from nowhere. The moment you make up your mind that you will follow what God is saying, Satan, will, what did I tell you earlier? When God raises, God is trying to raise you up, Satan will raise people. You will find that friend who hasn't spoken to you in a long time. Be like, hey, Joe, Joe, what's going on? And they will bring you the mind of Satan. The Red Sea is the opinions of men. The Red Sea is the voice of the multitude. And that is the reason why many of us have rebelled against God. It is the Red Sea because it represents the multitude of the people. But what is the antidote to rebellion? What brings you back in alignment with God? The red drop of the blood of Jesus. That is the reason why, once again, the Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. The reason why we break bread, what did Jesus say? Remember when Jesus said, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus is saying, if you don't remember me, you will remember the Red Sea. The Red Sea is very memorable because it will not let you forget. People don't let you forget. They remind you in the news, in textbooks, through what your children learn at school, through your friends at work, your clients, everybody, even your neighbors, will remind you of the evil that everybody does and tells you. And they tell you, I mean, your taxes, this is what we've been doing. And you're like, man, people have been saving that much money on their taxes. Where have I been? You have been in the presence of God. Stay there. The Bible says, do not hurry out of the presence of the king. Why should you stand in an evil place? Solomon. Psalms of Solomon, I believe, chapter 8. Or maybe Proverbs chapter 8. Don't hurry away from the presence of the king. Do, even if you are the only one that is doing what you're doing. God is not building his church on the consensus of opinion, but is building his church on the uniqueness of revelation. That is why he says you are a king and a priest unto your God. You are a royal priesthood and a people of peculiarities. You're supposed to do things by uniqueness, not by popularity. When I was little, I wanted to be famous. And one day the Lord showed me the price tag for fame. I'm like, uh, no thanks. I'm actually okay. Because the Bible says, strive to live your life peaceably and quietly. But people want to make noise about their existence. And that is why when they're speaking, you don't hear God. Because their blink is too loud. Let me say this one more time, folks. The Bible says, they did not remember the multitude of your mercies. So how do you remember the multitude of God's mercies? By doing what Jesus says. He says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. Take the blood. That is the only red thing that you need. Not the Red Sea, you need the red blood of Jesus. And that would allow your spirit to remember the mercies of God. And the moment your spirit remembers the mercies of God, it submits once again your life to the word and the counsel of God. And once that happens, you don't have to struggle with habits. You just start getting led by the Holy Spirit. So as we do this today in remembrance of you, Lord Jesus, let your word prevail. Let your word dwell richly in us. May we never forget your mercies. And when we forget, let us remember. For what we have forgotten, let there be a great, great remembrance as we eat of your body today and drink of your blood. So I want you to do this. The Lord wants us to do it this way. Take your bread and do it like Jesus said. Jesus says, you see this bread? He said, yes. He says, this is my body. He took the wine, he says, this is my blood. 
shed for you. So today, as we eat of the body of Jesus, and as we drink of his blood, we will receive the grace to remember the mercies of God, that we may align our hearts with the heart of the Father, so that once again, we can have our hearts beat for him and for his kingdom, that we may be led by his Holy Spirit always. You may eat and you may drink in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Let's be seated for two more minutes. Hallelujah. Alan, get ready to come and bless the offering. But I just want to quickly say this to us while we're here. Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. There is a lot going on in the realm of the spirit and I'm sure you're aware of it by now. But I'm just going to mention one thing and I'm just going to leave it as that. Okay? So, um, you cannot judge God wrongly. The devil is using that strategy to derail many people. And God brought it to my attention today and I want to share this with you. One of the things that the devil does is the devil wants you to challenge God. When he was tempting Job, what was the objective? He wanted Job to curse God so that he can die. And the wife of Job said it. She said, this life that you're living now is nothing. It's, it's completely nothing. So why don't you just curse God and die? You save yourself the trouble. So the devil is going around inciting people against God. And one of the ways by which he's doing it, he's saying, what have you got to show for your service to God? He's telling people, you claim to follow God. You claim to be serving God and serving his people. What have you got to show for it? Look at this, look at that, look at this, look at that. And the Holy Spirit reminded me today that the father of Noah, a man that the Bible says found favor in the sight of God was a blind man. Lamech was blind. In today's world, people would have said, oh, Noah cannot be chosen by God. Because if you have this relationship with God, if the angel of the Lord has visited you, if the host of heaven is helping you to build, how come you have a blind father? Can't you just heal your father? People will be used by Satan to question your commitment and your devotion to God. You need to learn how to say it is not about me or mine. It is all about him. When Jesus was arrested and nailed to the cross, what did people tell him? They said, no, he cannot be the Messiah because if you are the physician, why can't you heal yourself? There are certain times that we have to live with certain things just because it's a way of demonstrating to God that we're not trying to use all of heaven's resources to bring our life's pleasure, but we're trying to use all of what we have to give God pleasure. Don't let the devil incite you against your loving heavenly father. Guard your heart with all diligence. God bless you. Alan. Praise the Lord. Let's celebrate the man of God here. We're gonna go ahead and prepare our offering. If we can go ahead and get the offering slide up. You'll see it on either side of the screens here. If you need an envelope, we have it here on the made new uh, desk. And if this is your first time joining us, please fill out a connect card. We wanna lock in with you, uh, get you connected with us so we can push out updates to you so you know what's going on here. Uh, we want you to be a part of what the Lord is doing. Amen. So I give us just a couple of more seconds as we see the offering details there. And I'll remind us in our giving of a scripture we read earlier. 
1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4, it reads, But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. We give God praise for this house, this communion house, a place where the Lord has seen fit for us to see, for us to experience him and his fullness, to hear his voice plainly. And I want for us in our giving, for uh, our giving to represent that, to be an, an offering of how the Lord has dealt with us beautifully this season, how he has revealed so much to us. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for these offerings being sent up to you, O oh God. Offerings of faith, offerings of worship unto you for what you've done. For we know your word declares that the silver is yours, the gold is yours, O oh God. All in the earth belong to you, that you give seed to the sower. Lord, we offer this up to you and ask that it be pleasing in your sight. Let it be sweet smelling. Lord, we thank you for what you have poured out to us, in us, in this service tonight. The man of God that you sent to minister the gospel, O oh God, how you have revealed mysteries unto us, how you've reminded us, how you teach us by your Holy Spirit, that great counselor, that great helper. Lord, we declare that all glory and honor belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen. Hallelujah. So look, 2022 flew by, okay? I feel like every year, the whole year feels like yesterday. It's just going by at light speed. And so I'm excited to announce that we'll have our watch night service this Saturday, all right? Come on, come on, invite somebody. Let's celebrate God. This Saturday, 6.30, we're gonna come in and worship. We're gonna have an awesome time um, of fellowship. And we really got the pregame tonight. You know, we know how to posture ourselves going into uh, this Saturday service. So let's just give God praise for that. Uh, again, if this is your, all right now, if this is your first time here, please fill out a card. Uh, we want to get connected with you and get you plugged in. But again, this Saturday, 6.30, um, check out our Instagram. We'll be posting any updates there. And you'll see also in the WhatsApp chat. All righty. Praise God. Father, we thank you again for this service, for what you've done in this, uh, done in us tonight. Oh God, now let us run with it, oh God. Let us walk hand in hand with what you have given us, oh God, that we, or that you be glorified in us as vessels, oh God, as servants unto you, as friends of you, oh God. Lord, we give all glory to you and we say we love you in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen. Alrighty, everyone have a blessed week.